In this week's video, we'll review long-term and present-day charts to help us answer the question, are investors prepared for what history says will most likely happen? An article with this title recently appeared in the Wall Street Journal. The topic was decision fatigue. It wasn't specific to markets, but there are concepts in the article that we use every week in these videos. It said we should be skeptical of our own personal gut reactions, which often aren't grounded in evidence. Instead, for big decisions, we should tap the wisdom of crowds. Bringing in outside judgment can mitigate our own biases. Let's look at a recent example. You may remember on Black Friday, the Dow suffered its worst trading day of 2021. And when we turn to outside judgment, remember we said things look bad on Black Friday, but when you looked at the close, it really didn't look like a market that was at maximum economic fear. And when we compared the strength of the S&P 500's trend in the center of your screen after the close on Black Friday, it really didn't align with a gut reaction that was negative on that day. From the same Wall Street Journal article, humans just aren't great at sifting through options. We're spooked by small probabilities of risk and often rely on stereotypes instead of detailed data. It's very, very easy to get wrapped up in the day-to-day -day headlines, the day-to-day -day fears, and day-to-day -day market movements. And thus, it can be helpful to gain an understanding of what it might look like to navigate between a point A and a point B in the markets that could be several years down the road. Thus, for clients, it might be helpful to talk about our strategy from a longer-term perspective in general terms. Let's assume, for illustrative purposes, that the present day, early 2022, is similar to January 1st of 1996. And you may remember during 2021, we made several references to 2021, tying it back to 1995. We could show numerous examples, trend in 2021, the trend here in 1995. From a technical and a way to the evidence perspective, this looks like a strong bullish trend. And if we walk forward, the way to the evidence, including the S&P 500's 200-day moving average, can be used to help us discern between volatility to ignore and eventually at some point in the future what becomes volatility to respect. See, during this strong bullish period here, for the most part, price stays above an upward sloping 200-day moving average in red. And as we know, technical analysis really is about looking for small and subtle changes. So in 1998 here, this is a little bit of a yellow or red flag here. This looks quite a bit different than anything we've seen relative to this low in 1994. In this case, the market righted itself and continued to rally with some yellow flags along the way. And in early 2000, we're still getting some yellow flags here relative to price action. Since our trend in the present day is similar to this period in here, it might be helpful to go over some general concepts and overriding principles in terms of how we manage during a secular bullish trend. And in the present day, until proven otherwise, this is the base case that we'll manage against. And ultimately, when we see weakness like this, this, or this, the primary question that we ask is, does it still look like a secular bull market? Why is that relevant? Because if the answer is yes, bull markets by definition go on to make higher highs. And logically, if the answer is yes, and the weight of the evidence said we should go on to make a higher high after the bout of volatility, in this environment, it makes sense to tolerate larger drawdowns. And under our approach, we'll be looking to invest in the market itself and long-term market leaders in this type of environment. And we have no idea if we're going to see this type of environment walking forward from 2022, but we do have something similar in this window here this type of trend allows us to trade less. And all things being equal, trading tends to be bad. Reducing your trading frequency usually allows you to capture a higher percentage of market gains and gives you a higher probability of outperforming. And there can also be some benefits in taxable accounts. And in this type of environment, investing in the market and in market leaders, capturing market returns or a portion of market returns can be extremely satisfying. In this case, the S&P 500 from point A to point B 
the additional gain from here to here was 148%. Remember, we're not forecasting here. This is a base case that we can use to manage against in the present day. If we follow this script, it tells us something about probabilities. And if we start to deviate from the script, it tells us something about probabilities. Haven't seen anything like this for quite some time when we hit the peak in March of 2000. And in general terms, our base case now becomes, and so proven otherwise, the market's outlook is deteriorating from an odds perspective, and we want to try to transition to defensive assets. And now our primary question becomes, does it still look like a transition from bull to bear? Or have we recovered in a manner that tells us we might be on track again in terms of the secular trend? And eventually, at a major peak like this, if we walk forward, the evidence deteriorates to a point where we say now the odds favor a series of lower lows rather than a series of higher highs. So at this point, you're maintaining a defensive allocation. You're always keeping that flexible, unbiased, and open mind and looking for a change in the evidence. If we don't see it, we continue with that base case. And you can see as we step forward here, the market looks different over here than it really does over here. And again, this is a proxy for the weight of the evidence. Nothing magical about the 200-day moving average. In fact, there's nothing magical about any input used in the market model. All of it simply helps us assess the probability of good things happening relative to the probability of bad things happening. When we get to this major low in October of 2002 where my cursor is, we can use this hypothetical example to illustrate what we're trying to accomplish from a longer-term perspective. So let's assume on January 1st, 1996, down here where my cursor is, we invest a million dollars. Had we done that, that gain of approximately 148% between point A and point B says hypothetically the million dollars would be worth about 2.5 million when the market peaks. Really what we're trying to do Trying to keep our capital in harm's way when the odds are in our favor. When the odds start to become mixed, we start to migrate to a more defensive posture. And when the weight of the evidence, the facts in front of us, shift to where the odds are now clearly against the stock market, we want to start to reduce our exposure to risk and migrate to defensive assets until something significantly changes. So up here, you're feeling really, really good. You have approximately 148% gain. Your million dollars has turned into approximately 2.5 million. That's the good news. The bad news. The decline on the S&P 500 from the spring of 2000 up here to the low in October of 2002 was just a little bit under 50%, meaning your 2.4 million, unfortunately, becomes 1.2 million down here. And what that means from a return perspective is just as our hypothetical investor was feeling really, really good up here with a 148% gain, they're not feeling particularly good at all down here when that 148% gain gets reduced to 26.11%. Where does this number come from? That's the gain between point A and point C. So what we're trying to do in a secular bull market, we're trying to capture a percentage of market returns or better than market returns. And then when things start to shift, this is where we want to really start to give ourselves a chance to outperform significantly. And doing some risk management along the way and having a goal of trying to protect these gains up here is where the concept of sleep adjusted returns comes into play. If you put the pedal to the metal all the way during this bull market and you gain 148% or so, that sounds great, but it's not particularly great if you give half of it back. So when we're down here at this major low, we're still waking up every day with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind looking for material improvement in the evidence. And eventually, things did start to improve. And as you can see, the look of the chart here looks quite a bit better in here than it did at any point after the major peak. So from this point forward, you're running a similar strategy to what you were running over here. This trend isn't as strong, but it's still using similar principles to try to navigate between this point A and this point B. 
and still waking up every day with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The probability of good things happening is quite a bit different here relative to this point here. There's a lot of information in these charts here. It's a simple line with a moving average. But it's pretty easy to see the wisdom of the crowd is quite a bit different here than it is over here. And all of this helps us make decisions that are grounded in evidence. And eventually, in March of 2009, the evidence started to improve. Thus, hypothetically, if the present day was similar to 1996, it's possible the market would rally until 2026 and then enter a period of malaise. It's also possible, instead of being in this area here, that we're in this area here somewhere. In this general window in here, 1987 to 1989, is based on the demographic analysis that we did on September 24th of last year. And you can make a case with this data that in early 2021, we're in this window here somewhere, early to maybe the summer of 1989. And that's not our purpose here. We're not trying to say the present day is this point here or this point here. We're trying to gain a better understanding of what might be coming in the future, what our base case may or may not look like. If we have a base case, when the market starts to deviate from the base case, even if bad things happen, we'll be much better prepared. And since the markets have performed extremely well since the COVID low, it's important to remember it's not always that easy. This chart here shows the percentage change in the S&P 500 index. And while it may seem unbelievable, the percentage change from March 23rd of 2000 on the left side of the screen until February 15th of 2013, it was negative. That means historically, and in the relatively recent past, we have a period lasting almost 13 years where between point A and point B, the S&P 500 index basically went absolutely positively nowhere. You can see the numbers down here. On March 23rd of 2000, the S&P 500 index closed at 1527 and change. Almost 13 years later, it closed at 1519 and change, slightly lower than it was 13 years earlier. Thus, until proven otherwise in the present day, our base case is over here on the left side of the screen, but we're always keeping an open mind about much worse than expected outcomes. For full year 2021, the Russell 2000 was up 13.7%, Dow Jones Industrial Average 18.73, CCM Market Model 20.77, NASDAQ Composite Index 21.39, and the S&P 500 index 26.89. A little bit more detail on this number here. We have a model account, an actual account, that we use in conjunction with the hard data from the market model to make decisions. The model account is a single static account, meaning during the year it had no deposits and no withdrawals. And all the changes for this account are done in large blocks. So all clients get the same execution price on the way in and on the way out. So it's very, very easy to calculate this return. You can literally go to the statement at the end of the year, go out a year later and do the simple math and it works. In terms of the average account, a little bit lower because there can be some variances. If you're trying to run the market model over five accounts, there's some inefficiencies in there. And unlike this account here, some accounts see deposits and withdrawals during the year, which also can cause some variance. Median account, very, very similar, 20.76. And given our objectives, and based on the fact that the average return for the S&P 500, NASDAQ, Dow, and Russell 2000 was 20.18%, we are very, very pleased with this return, especially in the context of managing risk between point A and point B. And one of the ways that you can try to outperform the S&P 500 is to try to invest in ETFs tied to NASDAQ stocks, Dow stocks, or to go to small or mid caps. And as you can see, they didn't really offer a great place to go in terms of trying to beat the S&P 500. The average of this number, this number, and this number, 17.94. 
So not a lot of opportunities to outperform in these other three boxes relative to this box. And that's not particularly surprising. It's very, very difficult to beat the S&P 500. But if we're trying to compound our capital, that's really not necessary during secular bull markets, at least in this hypothetical example. I don't really know of anybody that would be disappointed with a 148% return. And as always, none of this represents a forecast. This bullet point clearly states, over the next four to five years, market gains could be very satisfying. That's the base case. The base case is subject to change. If the evidence shifts, then we have to reassess the probability of good things happening relative to the probability of bad things happening. In terms of compounding capital, anytime you can get double digit returns, really, really good things can happen. Our current minimum investment is 750,000. 20% gain on 750,000 is $150,000. And a 20% gain on 5 million is a million. You really start to understand the miracle of compounding when you see numbers like this. And our goal is to put our capital in harm's way when we can leverage the miracle of compounding. When the odds tell us the weight of the evidence favors higher highs relative to a series of lower lows. Because unfortunately, the miracle of compounding can work against you as well. The market dropped 49.14% in this B to C window here, and that can be very, very painful. And if we go back to the longer term example and assume the present day is similar to this window down here near point A, hypothetically, the bull market could have a long way to run. This point would be similar to 2033, and this would be similar to 2046. And the purpose of doing all of this, we're trying to understand how will we handle a market like this over here? How will we handle a trend like this? How will we handle a period like this where the market goes nowhere for almost 13 years? And during secular trends, at least historically, investing in the market and in long-term market leaders can produce very, very satisfying returns between a point A and a point B that could be several years down the road. In this case, from point A to point B, the S&P 500 gained approximately 450%. That's market return, which means a million down here at point B, hypothetically, would be worth almost 5.5 million at point B. But the give back can still be very, very painful. If we lost 49.14% as the market did from point B to point C down here, hypothetically, our 5.5 million up here hypothetically would turn into about 2.7 million. And what that does hypothetically is take this 450% gain where you feel like you own the world and it becomes very, very humbling if it turns into 180% gain. 180% gain is still outstanding. So really what our goal is, we want to try to perform during a full market cycle, which is the bullish trend and the bearish trend. So hopefully when you get down here, you've got more capital to invest when the evidence starts to improve. And maybe more importantly, you can sleep well over here and you can sleep well over here and still leverage the miracle of compounding during the secular bullish trend. And the goal would be to mitigate some of this damage over here or even migrate to defensive assets that can make money between point B and point C. And another relevant point about this number here, it allows us to outpace inflation and protect our purchasing power. So we've already shown that the NASDAQ, Dow, and small caps weren't particularly helpful over the full year. Another challenge in terms of trying to beat the market this year, many asset classes, including small caps, broke out of the gates at breakneck speed and then slowed down significantly. This 13.7% is the more widely accepted Russell 2000 small cap index. Even some of the small cap indices that did better, the S&P 600 small cap index, you can see from December 31st of last year to March 12th, was absolutely crushing the S&P 500. But you can see on the right side of the screen, that trend didn't hold up for the entire year. The same small cap index was up 0.29% between March 12th and the end of the year. 
while small caps were extremely helpful on the front end, not particularly helpful on the back end. In fact, they were harmful. December 31st to May 12th, value absolutely crushed growth. Didn't last. Back end of the year, the other way around. And as we all know, the confusion and all of these whipsaws and indecisiveness, for the most part, are related to uncertainty about the future of interest rates. Notice where the outperformance starts to slow down. March 12th, May 12th. If we look at interest rates, here's March. Here's May. And in early January, we've exceeded these highs here as of January 5th. But the 10-year yield was still lower than this point here. So this is still going to be a big driver walking forward relative to all these topics. Very, very similar theme here. Tech versus small caps early in the year. Second half, almost the polar opposite. December 31st to June 8th. This can help you outperform. This can help you outperform. That trend did not last. A lot of this here and a lot of these shifts here had to do with the uncertainties about the virus. In this window here, the market starts to believe that the virus may be behind us. As we all know, that wasn't the case. And even in January of 2022, the virus is still on the market's radar. Thus, instead of having leadership trends that lasted the entire year, we really had leadership whipsaws. And we take those whipsaws into account, and we take this number here into account. It's one of the reasons why we're very, very happy and satisfied with this number. And if you looked at your allocations during the year, at some point we start to say it's going to be tough to beat the market. We start allocating more to the market itself. Why do you do that? Because if it's difficult to outperform and the trends just aren't there, you want to make sure that you're capturing a reasonable percentage of the opportunity relative to the market itself. As we stated previously, it's very, very difficult to beat the market, and that should be part of your strategy. You should respect that it's very, very difficult to beat the market. Another way to try to do it is via S&P 500 sectors. Thus, at the end of the year, you don't want to own the laggards. These are the laggards. We didn't own XLC, didn't own XLP, didn't own XLU, and didn't own XLV. We did have some relatively small exposure to XLI, but on a relative basis, hardly made a big bet here, and it still performed pretty well. So these are your laggards. They wouldn't have helped you during the full year beat the S&P 500. And in terms of trying to beat the index, there are some years where the leaders lead for the entire year, or at least there's a strong trend of leadership. So in this case, the S&P is here. Here are your leaders. Materials, discretionary, financials, technology, real estate, and energy. Let's talk about those. So did we have discernible and lasting trends this year? This is the full year performance. The answer to that question is no. From June 4th to December 31st, if you were invested in the leader XLB, that hurt you. It was a laggard. Same thing for XLF. It helped you early in the year, but it hurt you later in the year. No consistency there. Same thing with energy. Energy did very, very well, wire to wire, but it did very, very poorly from June 4th to December 31st. Again, one of the reasons why our exposure to broader instruments was expanded during the year. Another topic here, if we look at XLB, XLY, XLF, XLK, real estate, and energy, and we ask ourselves, how many of those are long-term market leaders? Now, as we already showed in the second half of the year, or at least from June 4th walking forward, they didn't provide consistent leadership relative to the market. They underperformed. In fact, energy relative to the S&P 500 made a high here in June of 2020, came back to that same region earlier in 2021, and since then has made a series of lower highs. Now, those probabilities change if we can get into this area here. That may happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And another thing to consider from a longer-term perspective, XLE remains clearly in a downtrend relative to the S&P 500. What does that mean? If that downtrend continues, this is a trade. You're trying to go from here to here, 
And if the downtrend continues, you need to sell here and redeploy the capital. That's not really what we're trying to accomplish during a secular trend. All things being equal in a perfect world, you'd like to ride these things for several years or at least some of your positions or a portion of your positions. That might be difficult to do with something like this. How about small caps and mid caps? Similar situation. IWM, which is tied to that Russell 2000 index. You can see here early in the year, it did extremely well. Second half of the year on a relative basis, resumed what is a long-term downtrend. How about value relative to growth? Longer term, uptrend, downtrend, who's winning? This is as of January 5th, right now, it's clearly a downtrend against VTV value relative to growth. That would be the bad news from a probability perspective. The good news would be, even if the downtrend remains and you close this white space here and come back to the downward sloping 50 month, this could be a nice period of outperformance. And the other thing is you don't know. It's very, very possible we will get a trend change. So we're not down on value relative to growth. This is just the chart that we have in front of us. And really what you're using this for is how much capital are you willing to allocate to something like value? In our case, we take into account that it's still in a long-term downtrend until proven otherwise, this would be a trade. If this flips over, then it could be more of an investment. So these are the ETFs here that wire to wire could have helped you beat the S&P 500 this year. Well, materials don't check that long-term uptrend box relative to the market yet. This is XLB relative to SPY. Came up, looked like it was breaking out, and right now, it's still in a downtrend. Financials, same situation. Really haven't seen anything here to tell us that it's in a longer-term uptrend. Energy, similar situation here. It remains below XLE relative to SPY, below a downward sloping 50-month moving average. XLRE real estate, same thing. If you're trying to use this to outperform here, it does outperform, but it's a trade. You're eventually going to have to dump it because the downtrend, this is a counter trend move within a downtrend, a counter trend move within a downtrend. Until proven otherwise, this is also a counter trend move within a downtrend. We're not assuming that these trends are going to remain in place. We trade the chart in front of us. This is the chart in front of us today. Not rooting against XLE, we have some exposure to it. Not rooting against XLF, have some exposure to it. Not rooting against VTV, have some exposure to it. If those trends change, then we can increase our exposure. How about the other ETFs that beat the S&P 500 during the full year? You see XLY, long-term uptrend, that's more favorable from a long-term perspective relative to the SPY. You can see XLY relative to SPY, long-term uptrend. Same thing with tech. The ratio is above an upward sloping 50 month moving average. Is it possible that we fill this white space? Absolutely, positively, yes. Last thing this did was make a new all-time high. And in terms of XLY, making a big bet on that in 2021, you can make an argument that you'd rather make a bigger bet on growth because XLY remains in a longer term downtrend relative to VUG. Now, there's no question we have some improvement here. Are there other reasons to believe that materials or energy may be strong enough to flip these from downtrends to uptrends? Well, from an earnings perspective, Hard to say materials in terms of expectations. The answer would be yes. Earnings growth in 2022 is expected to lag the S&P 500. But energy, different story there. Earnings growth here is expected to be very, very impressive. Telling us to keep an open mind, even if this downtrend continues, XLE could come and tag this downward sloping 50 month or even exceed it as XLB did on a relative basis. As always, we're open to all outcomes, not making any assumptions about how this plays out or this plays out. But we do know with 100% certainty, we can look at the chart today and assess it. It's quite a bit different than trying to predict what it's going to look like tomorrow. And if we zoom in on the XLB, XLE charts, have to be aware here, this is consolidation. So we could turn up 
Here we had consolidation, we had a false breakout, then we made a lower low. Here we had consolidation, we made a false breakout, and then made a lower low. So it's possible this breakout here, this failed thus far, we could see something similar over here. It's also possible we could see something similar with interest rates. They could break out and then get somewhat of a false breakout look. Keep an open mind about all outcomes. This here is discernible change. We did get a monthly close above the downward sloping 50 month telling us to keep an open mind about this higher low here eventually being exceeded by a higher high. We'll just have to see how it plays out. This portion of the video is being recorded around 2 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, January 7th. Let's revisit the general concept about decision making. Be skeptical of your own personal gut reactions, which often aren't grounded in evidence. Instead, for big decisions, tap the wisdom of crowds. Bringing an outside judgment can mitigate our own biases. Let's see how that can help us in the present day in the context of the NASDAQ starting off 2022 with the worst three-day trading start to a year since 2008. This is the look of the NASDAQ here, three trading days into 2008. In that case, it was January 4th, 2008. And these are our moving averages from the 50 here in blue all the way out to the 250 day moving average in silver. Let's also take a look at the S&P 500 on the left side of the screen, three trading days into calendar year 2008. Objectively, how does the same chart look today? Pretty easy to say the look of the chart as of the close on January 5th, 2022 was much, much better. How about the NASDAQ? Right side of your screen, NASDAQ three trading days into 2008. We could spend a lot of time comparing and contrasting the chart on the right side of the screen with the chart on the left side of the screen. Rather than doing that, let's try to do it in an even more objective manner numerically, comparing this and this. We can do that by looking at trend strength scores. These come from the CCM market model. They go from zero to 100, right side of your screen. 100 is the best score that you can get. These scores here were calculated during the trading session on Friday, January 7th, when the S&P 500 was down 29 points. So this is five trading days into the year intraday. This is five trading days into the year at the close on January 8th, 2008. You can see it's quite a bit worse, almost the polar opposite. The long-term score, zero here, 100 here. On all time frames, five here and 100 here. So these are the figures for the S&P 500. How do they look for the NASDAQ? The close on January 8th, 2008, the NASDAQ, all the trend scores, a seven. If we just focus on the longer term components, a two. Again, that model goes from zero to 100. Present day looks quite a bit better. In the present day, intraday on January 7th, you get a 91 and a 98 out of 100. These charts and these scores allow us to make decisions that are grounded in evidence, and they also allow us to tap the wisdom of crowds. This is objective data here, the charts, but subjectively, you still have to interpret it in some way. These scores here in the model take that objectivity to another level and a much more useful level. So what prompted the title of this week's video? Are investors prepared for what history says will most likely happen. It's really tied to recency bias and recency bias is a fractal concept. It can apply to very, very short time frames, intermediate time frames in longer term time frames. And in the stock market, from an investing perspective, markets can actually be quite cruel because typically what happens is markets trend for very, very long periods of time. And psychologically, when you're up here, so this is a chart of the S&P 500 in the late 1990s. It's very, very difficult to conceive that a balanced portfolio is really where you want to be over the next 13 years in here. And conversely, when this secular bull starts, 
back in 1982 is very, very difficult based on recent history, which looks more like this consolidation up here to conceive that having somewhat of a buy and hold approach, 100% in stocks is the way to go. And if you walked into a conference room on Wall Street after the 1987 crash, somewhere in here in 1989 or 1990-ish, and you made a presentation that said, we're in a secular bull market and we're going to look like this into the spring of 2000, there would have been a lot of skepticism, just as there's skepticism today that the stock market could rally from 2022 into 2033 or even 2038 or 2040. And if history repeats itself and we do see something like this, when we get up here after several years of strong trends and very, very healthy market gains in the stock market, it's going to be very, very difficult for people to comprehend that something like this can happen where the S&P 500 goes absolutely positively nowhere for approximately 13 years. And if we wanna to try to navigate even under a best case scenario between a point A and a point B up here that could be several years down the road, we still have to have realistic expectations about how markets operate in the real world. So a little Q&A up here from the book Market Wizards about trends. Question. In other words, in order to score the really large gains, you have to be willing to see those gains erode significantly before getting out of the market. Answer, I can't see any other way. If you get too careful about not risking your gains, you're not going to be able to extract a large profit. It's somewhat easy in retrospect to see the trend, the benefit of hindsight. And a 450% gain looks very, very attractive. However, between point A and point B, the average intra-year drawdown in the S&P 500 was almost 10% where my cursor is. The median drawdown was 8%. We had, for the most part, a bear market in 1990. And remember, we have the 1987 crash here that occurs within the context of a secular bull market between 1982 and 2000, just as we had the COVID crash in 2020 within the context of a secular bull market. Secular bull market does not mean everything's rosy. It can still have very, very painful and large drawdowns. And if history is any guide in the next few years, seeing a drawdown between 8, 14, even 19, or close to 20% would not really be particularly abnormal. This data here in this table comes from JP Morgan Asset Management. Thus, until proven otherwise, this remains the base case, a secular trend. And the primary question is always, does it still look like a secular bull market? It's very, very difficult to look at the chart here, and I can look at the chart during the session on January 7th as well and draw the same conclusion. It's very, very difficult to look at this number here and this number here, numbers that were calculated during the session on Friday, January 7th, when the S&P was down 29 points. It's very, very difficult to look at this and this and the weight of the evidence that we have in hand today and be posed with the question, does it still look like a secular bull market and answer it in any other way other than yes at this point. And remember, all of this is just to help us prepare for a wide range of outcomes. It gives us something to manage against. And some of the key takeaways, 1982 to the year 2000, strong trend. At some point, the market has to consolidate its gains. And the concept of strong trends and gains being followed by consolidation, that's a fractal concept. It applies to all time frames. The exercise that we've just gone through this week helps us understand a wide range of market profiles. There's a wide range of market profiles on the screen now. Based on what we know today, for the foreseeable future, demographics are going to be a tailwind for risk assets. As we walk forward, we'll continually ask, are we allocated properly 
based on the facts in hand. If the answer is yes, we're not sure, leave it alone. If the answer is no, we make some incremental adjustments to get back in line with the weight of the evidence. We always want to have a base case, a short-term base case, an intermediate-term base case, and a long-term base case. Those aren't predictions. They give us something to manage against. The facts in front of us start to deviate from the base case. Then we have to adjust the probabilities. And we have to come up with a new base case. And all of this speaks to our approach on our time frame. Yours may vary significantly, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's one of the beauties of markets. They can be approached in multiple ways. So just as we woke up this morning, every day in 2022, we want to wake up being open to a wide range of outcomes. Predictions and forecasting bring our ego into the equation. Under our approach, we'd prefer to leave our egos out of the equation. And we all know the only way any of this works is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice. And Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates, or clients, may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.